All right, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 3. Joshua, chapter 3. You know, uh, last week we had uh, Rahab the harlot. And we visited Rahab the harlot with two spies, and, and there was a promise made that if they tie up the red cord that let down the spies away from her house, that when Israel came to conquer Jericho, that her family would be protected. So here where the Israelites are, and they're in a little town right across from the Jordan River, and they're about ready to cross the Jordan. Remember that Jericho is right on the other side of the Jordan River, about six miles from where they are right now. And uh, one of the things that probably I should have mentioned last week was when the two men returned. This is chapter 2, verse 23. When the two men returned and came down the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, they related to him all that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, listen to this. Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. Great word of encouragement. So remember, they're going to go into the promised land. They're, at this point, they're on the other side of the Jordan. Really, 12 spies have gone across the first time 40 years before. And now two spies have gone across to see Rahab. And now the entire nation is on the other side of the Jordan River, ready to enter the land. Now remember, the whole generation has died off because the 40 years they've been wandering in the wilderness. So all those adults that were there in the wilderness, they've all died off. And so now this whole new generation is ready to enter the promised land. And remember where they're going. God was taking them from the land of not enough, Egypt, through the land of just enough, the wilderness, into the land of more than enough, the promised land. So say that with me. God is moving us. God is moving us from the land of not enough, through the land of just enough, into the land of more than enough. So I hope that you want to go into the land of more than enough. And that more than enough land is not heaven. Because remember, heaven doesn't have to be fought for. But in this land, you're going to have to fight to get in. And that land of more than enough is a land of, of, of blessing and provision. It's a land of victory and triumph. It's a land of intimate relationship and revelation of God. And God wants that for all of us. So let me go ahead and read. I'm going to read chapter 3. I'm going to get down here on the floor so you can see me. And I'm going to read what is a very extensive passage of Scripture. I'm going to read chapter 3 and chapter 4. And I'm going to read it fast because I know y'all have a long teaching span. <laughs> but I'm going to read it fast. So, uh, and I think Eric's going to try to call me with the scripture up above. But I'm going to read all of chapter 3 and 4. And I, I really thought a lot about how much of this should I read. But I have the story is so rich and full that I'm going to read the entire passage. So beginning with chapter 3 verse 1, then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to Jerusalem, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from that place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits. So that's 3,000 feet by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. He wanted to make sure that they saw where they were headed because this was a place they had never been before. Verse 5, then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourself. The word is kadosh. It's make yourself holy, cleanse yourself, prepare yourself. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That word wonders is it means God's going to do something miraculous. He's going to do something that they've never seen before, nothing like it. And Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. Then they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said to Joshua, 
This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this, by what? By what I'm getting ready to do, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite, and the Mosquitoites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourself twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord of all the earth rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the ark of the covenant before the people... And when those who carried the ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, the waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, 20 miles away, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those which were flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet are standing and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. This will be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they are there to this day. For the priests who carried the Ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed. And when all the people had finished crossing, the Ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed for battle before the Lord to the desert plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him just as they revered Moses all the days of his life. Now the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests who carry the ark of the triumph, tri <laughs> or the ark of the triumph, the ark of the testimony that they come up from Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests saying, come up from the Jordan. It came about when the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come up from the middle of the Jordan and the soles of the priests feet were lifted up to dry ground that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Those 12 stones which they had taken from Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground 
For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. It's a long passage of Scripture, but so many important details. Now, what I want to show you from this passage is three ways that God helps us overcome obstacles. And the first is to remember God's power. And you see from this passage that God miraculously rolled back the Jordan River. Let me give you a couple of details. So the Jordan was at flood stage. This was about March or April. Normally the Jordan's only maybe 100 yards wide at the, at the widest point, at that point. But here the river was probably one to two miles wide. Now, the Jordan was a river that could be crossed. Remember, the 12 spies had crossed the Jordan River to go in to spy out the land 40 years before. And the two spies, they had crossed. They probably had to swim. The the water depth was somewhere at the normal stage. It's only about 18 to 20 feet. But at this point, it's probably 100 feet deep in the middle. So the idea of this entire group of people all crossing the Jordan River to go across to Jericho, they would have probably lost people. Also, it was flood stage, so the water was rushing. It was a mighty rushing. Anybody ever gone uh, whitewater rafting? This was a violent, violent river at this point. The Jordan River starts at 600 feet below sea level at the Sea of Galilee. It travels 200 miles in a circular path, only 70 miles in distance. But 200 miles of circulating, it goes all the way down to 1,300 feet below sea level. The land right by the Dead Sea, right there at the lowest, it's the lowest point on the face of the earth that's dry. So this water was rushing down this river, and it was violent, and it was, it was flood stage, so it was a wide river, difficult to cross. And you notice that what happened was they walked across, and literally it says that the river piled up at the town of Adam, 20 miles north. So 20 miles away, all this water backs up. It would have been, I was reading, people speculate about how this happened. So God could have instituted some kind of an earthquake that caused some kind of a dam that caused all the water to stop just like a a dam stops water. But the problem with that idea is that we would have some kind of evidence. There's a lot of tectonic activity in that area, but he would have had to have that earthquake happen precisely at the right moment so that when the priests step their feet in the edge of the water, suddenly the earthquake happens, the water stops, and everything happened right on time. Somebody said, I don't believe in coincidence, but I know that whenever I pray, coincidence happened. You know, this is an example of God doing something that you can't even call a coincidence. This is a miracle that happened. So here they are. Now, notice that, that they, uh, they walked across. The miracle wasn't just that the Jordan River was parted. You, know, you remember they had parted the Red Sea. God had parted the Red Sea already. So they had already, the, their forefathers had already crossed the Red Sea on dry land. This was a new miracle. And think about this, if you've ever walked in a muddy river, you ever walked to the edge of a muddy river, it's mucky, it's messy. I mean, I know I've stepped into a creek before and sunk all the way down to my ankles. So this was a miracle, not just of parting the water, and and whenever the Red Sea was parted, God blew wind all night long to dry up that path. This happened instantly. The priests stepped their feet in the edge of the water and suddenly, all of a sudden, this dried up from 20 miles north up on in, in the town of Adam, all the way down about another two to six miles down to the Dead Sea. All of that was dry, and they walked across on dry land. So here was the thing. What was, what was God doing this? Why did God do this? They could have crossed without God's help. It would have been challenging. It would have been difficult. God rolled back the Jordan because this people needed to see a fresh miracle from God. They needed to see that God was still just as triumphant as he had been to their forefathers. Think about this, this group of people, they had heard the stories of the plagues of Egypt, but most of them, the the youngest ones, they might be, it was 40 years old, they might remember some of that. But think about some of the things that happened when your kids were small. You almost have to just keep telling the story for them to remember it. So they didn't, they didn't remember clearly, and many of these would not have ever crossed the Red Sea. The youngest, 
the youngest at the time, they could have crossed the Red Sea, but they would hardly remember this. God needed to give them a fresh miracle of His power. He wanted them to remember His power. He wanted this fresh new generation to see that God can still do miracles. You know, they had seen manna in the wilderness, but in a way, the children of Israel who've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, it's almost like they were saying, well, what has God done for me lately? You ever been there? I go, okay, you know, I was saved. Some of you were saved longer ago than the 40 years these people walked in the wilderness, right? So many, many times Christians say, well, what has God done for me lately? And this is a great example of how God wants you to experience a miracle in the present time so you can remember now that God is still powerful. God wants you to experience that now. I think about in my own life sometimes whenever God rolled back the, the Jordan. See, this is like a gateway. God is showing them that there's a path into the promised land, into the land of more than enough. I remember years ago, when God called me to preach, and it was very, very distinctive. This was not one of those things where I had uh, a sort of a, a, an inkling. Uh, it wasn't that somebody else came up to me and said, hey, you know, you'd make a good preacher someday. None of that. In fact, truth be told, I was a preacher's kid. I've been running from the thing the whole life, right? So when God called me to preach, I, I got to admit, I argued with God. In fact, uh, uh, Tom, you, you may not like this much, but I argued with God and told him I'd rather be a minister of music. That's what I really want to be. And, uh, and so God said, no, I want you to preach and sing. So I sing some, all right? That's why I still sing some, because I still love music. But God called me into the ministry. But I, I, I thought, after this call, I'm like, now what? What do I do now? So I told a friend of mine named Harry, he was a Christian, and I said, Harry, God called me to the ministry. He goes, man, that's exciting. He was more excited than I was. I was scared. He was excited. And he said, that's great. And uh, so I thought, well, I don't know what's next. So three days later, Harry is, uh, he moonlighted fixing TVs in the base housing area. This was in Idaho. And uh, so he's sitting behind a TV, working behind a TV, and these two guys are out in the living room of this house where he is. And they say, you know, we gotta have a, pa we gotta have a preacher. This church was between pastors. They said, we gotta have a preacher. And they said, what are we gonna do on this particular date? And Harry dips his head up, out from behind the TV. He says, you guys need a preacher? And they said, yes, we do. Do you know one? He says, I do. He just, the God just called him to preach. He's gonna need some place to preach. And they said, what's his name? He said, his name is Steve Moses. They said, well, a name like Moses, we gotta try out this guy. <laughs> I've been getting that ever since then. But you know, within 30 days, God opened this door for me to preach. And it was one of those things that having that right there at the beginning was a great, it was a gateway to ministry. It was like God wanted to say to me, I got this. I have got this. I will open the door for you. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, I was in the Air Force. Some of y'all know I spent some time uh, enlisted in the Air Force. And after that call to ministry, I immediately started working on my bachelor's degree because I wanted to go to seminary. I really felt like God was calling me to seminary and I needed a bachelor's degree. And I had done only one semester of college and then uh, running away from home, I joined the Air Force. Uh, so I had my college still in front of me. So I started doing my college. I got all the way to the point where I knew when I was gonna graduate. I was gonna graduate in April and I knew that I would have another year left on my military contract. So I went over to the personnel office and I said, hey, is there any chance, I'm supposed to get out in March, is there any chance that I could get out just a few months early so that I could start seminary in the spring rather than waiting a whole year to go to seminary? And uh, the personnel office, he pulls up my record and he says, he says well, listen, you're in a, you're in a critical career field. Uh, you, uh, you're on a control tour because I was an instructor at the time. You are, you're a career airman because you re-enlisted. You, uh, you're, you're, uh, you had a re-enlistment bonus. And he goes through all these things and he said, he said, Steve, Moses, if you get out one day early, it will be a miracle. I looked at him and I said, well, I'm gonna pray for a miracle. <laughs> he said, give it your best shot. So three months later, I'm in a Bible study and one of my prayer requests from one of the members of the Bible study was, hey, we gotta pray for these people that have to get out right away. I said, what do you mean? Oh, they got this thing called Rollback 88. 
And everybody who has one year or less left on their contract has to immediately relist or get out. I said, one year or less left? That includes me. I could not wait. That was Friday night. I couldn't wait. Monday morning, I go down to the personnel office and I said, when I walked in the door, I saw the guy and he looks at me. He's got this gray look on his face. And he, you know, you could see this just, I just can't believe this. And I walk up to him and he said, I know what you're going to ask me. And I said, does it apply to me? And he said, yes. And I said, even if I'm in a critical career field? Yes. Even if I'm on a control tour? Yes. Even if I got a reenlistment? Yes. And you get to keep your bonus. And I, and, and I said, I said, this is incredible. I said, wow, God did a miracle. And I, you know what I said to him? I, I, I said, I can't believe God had to get thousands of people out of the Air Force just so he could get me out. And, and the cool thing is the title was Roll Back 88. You know how Jordan rolled back? The, God rolled back the Jordan River. I said, man alive, this is awesome. And those, listen, those miracles are the kinds of things, and God has done them again and again and again. I, I, I would, I'm, I'm out of time, but I would say that uh, how I met my wife was also another great story about how God did a miracle. And believe me, talk about a limiting factor and obstacle. If I didn't have a wife, that would be a huge obstacle to future ministry. And God gave me Joanne, so I'm so thrilled that God did that miracle for me. But what about you? What does God need to do in your life? What miracle does God need to do in your life to break you free? Maybe some of you have already experienced this. You say, well, I remember a time whenever God did a great miracle in my life, and God may want to do that again in your life. In fact, I was thinking this morning, Woodland Heights Baptist Church is at a point where we need that kind of a rollback miracle. Amen? Some of you look around and you say, wow, you know, this church could use a rollback miracle like that that God would bring in a great miracle so that he would break, break us in to an experience where this church experienced the land of more than enough. Amen? So let me talk about the second thing that God did. He's, this is not just to remember God's power, but remember his perspective. There are two sets of memorial stones. So the first set of stones, remember that they, uh, they, went, uh, they, went, uh, they were in the middle, the, the priests were in the middle with the Ark of the Covenant. And God told them to take 12 stones. Now, these are 12 smooth stones. These are river stones. Take the stones that are in the Jordan and bring them onto the other side and pile them up. And they were ultimately going to bring them to Gilgal, which was their camp. These 12 stones, God said, these are to be, mem these are to be ways of remembering. Look at verse 6 of chapter 4. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a, memor a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. We need these kinds of memorials too. They needed to be reminded. And remember what the text says, when your children someday ask you, what are those stones? Hopefully you can go back and point to those stones. What is the significance of these 12 smooth stones that are piled up? These 12 stones remind us that God did a miracle. He parted the Jordan. He dried up the Jordan so that we could walk across. These were a reminder for us continually of what God had done for us. We need those kinds of reminders. Sometimes you may need to just tell your testimony again and again. You need to be able to tell stories. You need to be able to write things down. Maybe you kept a journal. I don't know about you, but there's, there's a, an ongoing journal that I've written down through the years where I write things down that God has done remember those answers to prayer sometimes somebody will ask you tell me about a time when God did something great in your life well you ought to be able to remember one or two amen and those are the kinds of smooth stones the Bible is a great example of smooth stones you know the Israelites they didn't cross the Jordan River with a Bible in their hand like we do we have all of these smooth stones in the Bible the Bible is filled with memories of all the great things God has done all the promises that he's made and you should learn them you should read them you should memorize them they should become a part of your life so that whenever you need them you can go back and say hey wait a minute God has done miracles, but also in my own personal life. And these are great memories of what God has done. Songs are a great example of smooth stones. When we sing a song or we sing a hymn, you know, you, you probably ought to have a tune or two that's in your mind, that's in your heart, so that whenever you need a miracle, you can say, wait a minute, what has God done in my life? Now, 
All right, this is gonna embarrass my wife, but I've got a song in my head. I sing it all the time, and I'm gonna teach it to you. It goes like this. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? This is a great one for Jordan. Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible, and he can do what no other power can do. And it's not gonna be up on the screen. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible, and he can do what no other power can do. I'm gonna have you sing it with me. Got any rivers? Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? You think are uncrossable. Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes. God specializes in things thought impossible, in things thought impossible, and he can do what no other power could do. And he can do what no other power can do. So I give you a smooth stone. You can use that sometime. But there's also, in remembering God's perspective, not just things we need to remember to remember, but also things we need to remember to forget. Because when they crossed into the middle of that river, Joshua also said, pick up 12 stones and put them in the middle of the river. Now these were rocky stones. And I'm convinced by reading the text that because the whole nation had not crossed, he sent 12 men to get rocky stones from the wilderness side. Go get 12 rough stones and bring those and we're gonna put them right in the middle of the river. In fact, the text says they are here to this day. When I read things like that, I say, wow. If they're really still here today, that's really a long time for those 12 rocks to be there. But see, he said, I think that the children were to hear, hey, these 12 rocks, these 12 smooth stones, these smooth stones remind us that God rolled back the Jordan. But I can imagine the parents saying to those kids, another 12 stones. They're a different kind of memorial. They're under the Jordan River. They're in the Jordan River. We piled up 12 rocks down there in the middle of the Jordan River. Those 12 rocky stones remind us of the things we need to forget. There are things from the past that we need to forget. You know, some of them lost their parents in the wilderness. Some of them had really rough times in that, in that wilderness wandering. Maybe, maybe you're like me. You've got some things from your past that you would like to be able to forget. You know, sometimes the old devil will, will bring up things from our past and try to remind us. Basically, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He wants to accuse us at every chance. You can't really be a child of God if this kind of thing happened to you. You can't really be a child of God if, if you did these things in the past. And I believe what God was showing them that there are some things not only that need to be remembered, but there are some things that need to be forgotten. And these rough, rocky stones are a great memory of things that need to be left behind. Stances and situations. Maybe you had, yeah, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Anybody ever made a really dumb financial mistake? Anybody ever done that? Some of you are smiling, so you know what I'm talking about. If you live long enough on this planet, you're going to make some kind of a dumb mistake. You look back and you go, why did I do a decision that just really turned out so badly? You didn't pray about it and it's back there in your past and it haunts you. Why didn't I pray before I did this? Believe me, the children of Israel, there's great stories in the book of Joshua where they did the same thing. They made these decisions on a cuff and all of a sudden they went wrong and they say, oh, I wish I'd prayed about that. And I believe that God wants us to be able to remember to forget some of these things. Maybe there's some circumstance or situation, an injury or an illness that you'd like to leave back in the past so you can go forward. See, these stones remind us that not only do I need to go forward and remember that what God is doing now and what God did in the past, but I need to think about what God is going to do in the future, and I want to get rid of obstacles to my future living. What are those things that need to be removed so that you can keep going forward in your life? Sin is another great example. All of us have sin that we would like to be able to forget. I don't know, do you have a sin that you think back on and you say, wow, that sin bad. I wish I could forget about it. You know, 
So the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know that. But yet, if you're like me, there are some sins that you look back on and you say, Lord, I just need to, I just need to confess it one more time. You ever done that? Go back and I remember many times I, while I was a chaplain, I would have people come into my office. And many times, chaplain, What I'm getting ready to share with you, I have never told anybody in my entire life. And when that happened, I always paused for a moment and I said, of people that have come to me and poured out their Unconditional love. Because of what I've done. And that's one of unconditional love. That God could love you no matter what you've done. No matter what you've been through, God still loves you. That God can do that in us so that we can share that with others is such an incredibly powerful truth. It's from the West. I'm convinced that when you bring up an old sin that you've already confessed, what are we talking about here? Because I believe God is not just a great, faithful, powerful God, and a great God who remembers. He's also a great forgetter because he says, I'll remember him no more. Curry Tim Boom used to say that when we confess our sins and God forgives those sins, he casts those sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And he posts a sign that says, no fishing. And she always used to add, and that means you as well. Stop fishing in there and digging, it, digging up those old sins. That, that was the idea here. These rocky stones, they were under the water. Don't go back and swim into the Jordan and try to pick up those rocky stones and bring them with you into the land of more than enough. Leave those rocky stones where they belong and you move forward so that you can stop living in the past and start living in the future. I wonder where you are today in your walk with God. Where are you in terms of trusting God for the great things that God can do? You know, maybe you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, I run into people from time to time that have a religious conviction. They, they went to church. They did what they were supposed to do. In fact, sometimes somebody will say to me, well, I got baptized such and such a time back then when I was a certain age. You know what my follow-up question is always? Well, tell me about how you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if what you've got is an experience of baptism, which is supposed to be an outward sign of an inward reality, I want to know, do you also have that inward reality? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has he transformed your life? Listen, that's the first step. You can't go to the land of more than enough until you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, today's a great day to do that during our invitation time. We're gonna have an invitation hymn. And I, you know, while we're doing this invitation, I want you to think about what are those things that God needs to do in your life? What's the Jordan you need to cross? What's the, what's the powerful miracle that you need from God to move forward into the land of more than enough? What do you need God to do? What's the, 